Hi, and welcome back to the E3SM Biogeochemistry webinar. Today, we have two speakers who are going to jointly present on some work that they've collaborated on together related to uncertainty quantification methods and applications for the E3SM model. So our speakers are Daniel Ricciuto and Kachik Sartsian from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and Sandia National Lab. So uh, Dan, take it away. Thanks, Susanna. Thanks for the invitation to speak. So as, as Susanna said, we'll be speaking about uncertainty quantification uh, focused on uh, E3SM land model. And I'd like to also acknowledge our, our contributors um, from Sandia, uh, Livermore Campus, Oak Ridge, um, LBNL, and MIT. And also I'd like to acknowledge our uh, funding sources, um, BER through E3SM and uh, the SIDAC program and also OSCAR also for SIDAC and uh, the Fast Math Institute, all of which contributed um, to this work. So I wanted to start today I can advance um, with a little bit of overview and motivation. So when we, we're talking about um, coupled biogeochemistry models, uh, most of our current understanding about uncertainty is from multi-model ensembles from uh, many modeling groups. And what we often see um, when we look at those outputs are a, a very large spread. So things like um, cumulative land flux over the next century uh, on the upper right there. Um, but when we're looking at BGC type outputs, uh, there are many quantities of interest that, that we're interested in. Um, one of them being cumulative land flux, but many others uh, shown on the, uh, the lower right there is an example from, from an ILAM um, diagnostics plot. So things like biomass or gross primary productivity or, or leaf area index. And that's just a, a small um, subset of the, the total uh, number of variables that we look at uh, in these model simulations. But on the other hand, there's not much in the way of formal kinds of uncertainty quantifications uh, of these models, especially for individual models, or individual mo modeling centers. And um, the primary reason for that is these models are uh, very expensive to run, as we know. Um, it could take many millions of CPU hours to complete a simulation, um, where as Uncertainty quantification methods generally require large ensembles of simulations um, to do that kind of evaluation. And these models contain many uncertain parameters. And so that's the high dimensionality um, part there. So some uncertainty quantification challenges that we're trying to address in our work through E3SM and, and SIDAC is trying to understand um, what processes drive uncertainty uh, in, in the LAM model and what accounts for key differences uh, among the different models, and can we do kind of formal uh, model calibration using observations or benchmarks that are available, uh, for example, from remote sensing to reduce um, both parameter and structural and prediction uncertainty in these models. So more specifically, talking about the land component uh, of, the, of these models. So ELM, shown on the left, is an increasingly complex model um, with many processes, and so it handles um, energy fluxes, uh, hydro hydrology, um, and increasingly complex representations of biochemist biogeochemistry through carbon and uh, nutrient cycling through plants um, and soil, and also um, land use changes and processes involved in that. And again, uh, large ensembles are needed to do uncertainty quantification, especially when we have a lot of uncertain uh, model parameters. And you might think, well, you know, uh, land models like ELM contribute uh, relatively little to the computation of the full coupled model. Um, and so why can't we just go ahead and do those big ensembles? But when we're talking about um, biogeochemistry and we're perturbing parameters, and that requires us to do lots of model spin-ups as well, which involve hundreds of years generally of um, model simulation. And so that definitely limits the size of the ensembles we can run um, globally. So one thing we'll talk about in a lot more detail is surrogate modeling. Um, so the surrogate model basically is a, a representation of the more complex model. There are a number of different ways to produce those and they can increase the efficiency of UQ methods such as sensitivity analysis and calibration. 
So our SIDAC project is, is called um, Optimization of Sensor Networks for Improving Climate Model Predictions, um, given the acronym of OSCM, O-S-C-M. And so the, one of the key goals of that project is to um, formalize MODEX. So MODEX is a key uh, DOE initiative for iterative feedback between models, uh, experiments, and observations. And so that's, it's not really a new thing. And so you could think of um, this has been, been done for many years in terms of model improvement. You can start there on the left and say we have a new data set, our data that's been collected. We want to test that out uh, in the model to see how well the model performs. We may evaluate that and find some shortcomings, um, do some model development and new simulations, and that can help us um, determine where new observations might be uh, necessary, uh, new data sets. We go out and collect that new data and start that, that loop over again. And so this is an attempt to, to formalize that process through uncertainty quantification algorithms and we, we want to characterize the uncertainties in the models and then use those models to try to tell us where and when we can place new observations to optimally reduce those model prediction uncertainties and apply that specifically for the E3SM land model or ELM through existing and proposed new um, networks. And so, the, again, the key question there is what is the ideal placement of observation systems, in this case virtually in the model, um, to represent spatial and temporal variability in our signals of interest? And so I'll talk a little bit here about the infrastructure we've developed um, to enable uncertainty quantification. And so what you'll hear about um, from Kachik involves studies from uh, E3SM or ELM single grid cell studies um, where we've run the V1 model at a number of different uh, flux, or flux net or eddy covariance sites globally. And we've also done a little bit of work with um, the ELM FATES uh, model with, uh, with Jennifer Holm and a, and a boreal Alaskan site. Um, and for those sort of single grid cell frameworks, we've developed a, a, a test bed using basically uh, ensembles, large ensembles of single column uh, ELM runs using MPI for Python to manage that as um, part of a testbed we've developed called the offline land model testbed to manage these ensembles and also do the post-processing. Um, so to look more at questions of um, regional uncertainty quantification, we developed a simplified version of ELM that only considers um, the carbon cycle, so it doesn't do the, the full energy balance uh, or the hydrology. Um, and so a subset of ELM parameters, 47 parameters is contained within that model. So it's still um, very highly dimensional and allows us to look at um, similar UQ algorithms that we might then apply to the full ELM. And it uses um, a submodel for photosynthesis or uh, the canopy flux portion of the code is one of the most um, time consuming. And so for that, um, we have a couple of different um, representations of that. Uh, more recently, we've begun using a neural network fit to the ELM photosynthesis module, which uh, reproduces the accuracy of um, ELM's prediction of photosynthesis or GPP uh, pretty, pretty accurately. And it's much faster than uh, ELM. And so it's, it's highly useful for us to do tests of um, regional to global scale UQ algorithms. And so now I'll hand it over to Kachik. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some more detail about surrogate modeling. Uh, hi. Uh, so the very first sort of vanilla and benign application of uncertainty quantification would be the uncertainty propagation where we have ranges of unknown physical input parameters given by a modeler. Uh, and then uh, the goal is to uh, propagate those uncertain input parameters to output predictions with uncertainty. This is a basic task of forward prediction, uh, which kind of comes uh, along with building surrogate and uh, pro and performing proper sensitivity analysis and looking into uh, parameter uncertainty attribution. And I'll detail uh, all these pieces as, as I go along. Um, uh, first of all, uh, this uh, methodology, uh, as Dan mentioned, works with the model as a black box, uh, non-intrusive. So all you need is an ensemble of simulations with varying or perturbing input parameters lambda. Uh, 
And uh, the uh, main advice here is that never analyze the ensemble directly. Usually, uh, it makes sense to build some kind of surrogate approximation to your model first and then uh, uh, analyze the surrogate itself uh, through various means. Uh, and the surrogate in various communities is called differently proxy, meta model, response surface, or supervised machine learning, if you wish. Um, next slide, Dan. So global sensitivity analysis uh, uh, comes off the surrogate usually uh, either through Monte Carlo or with some some types of surrogate we can get this information basically for free out of the surrogate construction. It enables selecting important parameters or rather uh, removing parameters that are not important. And by saying not important, I don't mean the parameters shouldn't be in the model. I mean the parameters should not be necessarily varied over the range that was provided initially because uh, that range does not contribute to output uncertainty uh, that much. So that dimensionality reduction is usually uh, uh, very, uh, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, it, it's an important uh, step towards the process and we do want to remove parameters that are not very important in terms of uncertainty. So this color bar is kind of a uh, uh, visual sketch of what we get uh, out of global sensitivity analysis, it's a, a predictive variance of a given QOI uh, attributed to different parameters uh, of the model. Um, what, what it means, it, uh, it means if I had to fix one of those parameters, uh, how much the overall output variance of the prediction will reduce. So that's sort of the interpretation. Um, and uh, we can, get to uh, GSA information for a range of outputs and then uh, figure out if a parameter does not impact any of those in a considerable way, we can drop it from the sort of next cycle of surrogate construction. Also, this generalizes to joint sensitivities, joint parameter impact to a given quantity of interest. Uh, the uh, visual on the lower right corner is uh, demonstrating that basically one uh, the radius of a, of a circle is how important the parameter is uh, in terms of GSA, and the width of the edge joining two parameters is how important their joint impact is to a given uh, quantity of interest. So those are some results from uh, uh, prior work that we have done with Dan on uh, uh, ELM. Uh, next slide, Dan. And uh, to uh, emphasize a bit more this uh, this work, uh, this is a paper uh, uh, from a year or so ago uh, with uh, Dan Ricciuto. Uh, what we have done is we looked at uh, Fluxnet sites. Um, well, uh, no, we, we, we looked at uh, several Fluxnet sites that have uh, that have varying PFT plant functional types and uh, perform this uh, automated uh, sensitivity analysis of varying 68 model parameters. That's a huge challenge in terms of surrogate construction because 68 is considered a large number when you want to build an approximate model. Uh, however, uh, uh, we have uh, advanced methodologies with sparse, uh, sparse surrogate construction that allows us to build meaningful and relatively accurate surrogate across uh, all these uh, sites. And what we see, these uh, uh, bars, they show sensitivity or variance contributions at each of the sites. These are 96 sites, 96 bars, basically. Uh, uh, what we see is that uh, within PFT, there is relatively uh, a consistent uh, variance contribution distribution uh, 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 from the parameters uh, compared to uh, uh, across PFTs. And uh, at the end of the day, out of 60, Eight parameters, uh, we can select about a dozen of them that are uh, highly important uh, across all the sites. And for future studies like calibration, which we'll get to, uh, we do need a more accurate surrogate so we can focus on this lower dimensional 12 parameter perturbing analysis rather than all 68 parameter perturbation. Uh, so this performs two tasks. That does GSA, uh, builds a surrogate and allows us uh, to remove uh, non-important parameters from future studies. Um, the paper is published and the link is there uh, given on the slide. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll go to the next slide then. Uh, 
so the next two slides are uh, preliminary work uh, we have done with uh, Jennifer Holm. Uh, I probably want to justice uh, to properly interpret these results, but these are more or less a turnkey automated results out of an ensemble that Jennifer has, has uh, simulated, uh, where we have a, a set of parameters in fates, um, and uh, she has given us an ensemble of simulations, and we were able to um, down select uh, to a more important set of parameters. The next step would be to focus on these more important parameters, the four or five of them that only show up uh, as a main contributors to the uncertainty, and uh, uh, build more accurate surrogates for them and perform calibration given experimental obser observations uh, using the accurate surrogate. Uh, next slide uh, is along the same lines. This is uh, another study that we have done uh, with uh, uh, Jennifer. This uh, previous one was uh, over the time uh, horizon, uh, and uh, this one is uh, over several quantities of interest, average quantities of interest um, from the uh, from uh, needle leaf evergreen borel uh, PFT. Uh, again, this allows us to reduce the dimension in uh, input parameter space. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, we have a generic forward uncertainty propagation workflow that's uh, implemented and it's supposed to be uh, turnkey and hopefully it is. Uh, I encourage uh, people to ask questions or try to use this if you have an ensemble of simulations. Bottom line is if you have an ensemble, a matrix of inputs and matrix of outputs out of your black box model, uh, uh, this is supposed to be an automated uh, machinery to help figuring out the uncertainty contributions. And uh, I want to emphasize that some, for very accurate surrogate, uh, you often need a lot of members in the ensemble, a lot of simulations. Um, but there are methods, and these methods are implemented in the workflow that I'm mentioning. There are methods that can build surrogate even uh, uh, with very few uh, ensemble points. Well, the price to pay is that your surrogate uh, is not going to be very accurate, but that inaccuracy of the surrogate is also well quantified within this methodology. So it can deal with any number of samples, any number of model simulations, the more the merrier, of course. Next slide. So uh, various surrogate types have been explored, of course, and uh, uh, the sort of convention and usual one that we have started with is polynomial chaos surrogate. This is a misnomer, particularly in climate community, uh, when people think about chaos as in dynamical systems, it has nothing to do with chaos. And in its most sort of simplest interpretation, think of it as a polynomial fit or a regression, really. Uh, but uh, this is a machinery that allows you to properly have a functional representation of random variables. Think of your inputs and outputs as random variables. It comes with uh, uh, equipped with a, a moment estimation that is free, does not require any additional sampling, and sensitivity information also comes for free. You basically collect uh, coefficients in front of your polynomials in, a, in, in an appropriate way to get the GSA, global sensitivity information, for, for free. And this is not linear. It can work with highly nonlinear models, but certain level of smoothness is, of course, assumed. Smoothness of your output with respect to inputs. A larger class of uh, uh, surrogate are, uh, is a low rank tensor representation, which is a richer class, comes with a price that ha it's harder to construct often, but uh, there is this uh, line of thought, and it is correct, usually that nature is low rank, right? Only subset of inputs act together at the same time to a given quantity of interest. So there is a lot of room here to improve surrogate accuracy if you employ low rank tensor representations rather than just plain vanilla polynomial fit. And on the other end of spectrum come neural networks that are even richer class of functions that can deal with really non-smooth behaviors. We all know uh, the, the pros and cons of this approach. It can be very accurate when it works fine, but it's much harder to train and even harder to interpret. And I'll highlight some of the results that we got uh, from each of those uh, um, um, surrogate types. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll just very quickly go over this. This is sparse and low-rank tensor representation. Uh, as, as I said, uh, it's a richer class of functional representation that just takes into account uh, joint contributions of uh, parameters. It's much harder to find the coefficients or 
to quote unquote train it, but you can still get Sobol indices or sensitivity indices out of it for free. This is joint work with Cosmin Safta under our SIDAC project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, this one is a uh, joint work with uh, Vishagan, uh, who is a postdoc working with us on this uh, SIDAC project, where we have started to explore neural network surrogates that allow more flexibility, as I mentioned, and, uh, uh, and more accuracy. The, uh, the benign multi-layer foot-forward neural network is shown on the top, uh, where you have, in this case, we have 47 physical parameters, five daily forcing seri time series, you can fit that into your standard neural network with a few hidden layers and get outputs of interest and train and find relatively accurate approximation of your model. Uh, but uh, what works better is uh, if you change the architecture and include uh, these recurrence, your recurrent neural networks that have worked well uh, previously in time series type. Uh, actually, it, uh, it made its name uh, from natural language processing, but even uh, any time series you would think recurrent neural network would work better, and they do, than uh, vanilla MLP, multi-layer perceptron. Uh, uh, but we would like to build on top of that. If you go to the next slide, Dan, um, the standard recurrent neural network, which is long short-term memory LSTM architecture, uh, works fine, but for this uh, simplified ELM model that Dan just mentioned, we actually can go one step farther because we kind of can look under the hood and we know the processes and how they impact each other. So the recurrent neural network can be informed. The architecture can be informed with proper connections. That makes the training easier and eventually makes a uh, surrogate uh, constructed by this recurrent neural network uh, more accurate. Next slide. A few preliminary results just to uh, highlight uh, the power of this uh, uh, these are six uh, 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 six members of the ensemble. The dashed red line is the model. Uh, this is simplified ELM, actually. Uh, and uh, if you really look zoomed in, uh, you can see that three LSTM, which is this physics in fourth LSTM that I mentioned, the green is actually doing a better job in terms of daily dynamics uh, with a fraction of cost. Next slide. This is demonstration of the same type of result in a different way where we put it, uh, uh, this is GPP from uh, model itself and the surrogate for two different uh, months uh, across, I think, 30 years of study. Uh, this highlights uh, a little bit better that physics informed architecture, the green dots, the 3 LSTM actually works much better than the other two options. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as uh, uh, so, as I mentioned, there are a few uh, items that, as a price to pay when you use a neural network uh, instead of, say, polynomial cows. Well, first of all, sensitivity analysis. The picture on the uh, on the bottom is the sensitivity indices from a few different methods. Uh, we do get consistent picture, but for PCE polynomial cows, we get these numbers without uh, extra sampling. PC uh, sensitivity information comes for free. For neural network, you you have to do a lot of sampling of those to get your sensitivity indices. It's not a big deal if the limiting factor is the model ELM expense. So uh, so what if I have to run 100,000 evaluation of my RNN surrogate? As long as I am not running the ELM, that's fine usually. Uh, and the other uh, sort of uh, uh, con uh, of using neural network is that it does not necessarily come equipped with uncertainties although we have some initial work and thoughts how to incorporate, and there are some works out there recently in machine learning community uh, trying to incorporate uncertainties in neural network uh, surrogates. I think uh, uh, next slide is probably uh, going back to Dan for a few slides. Yeah, so th thanks, Kachik. Um, so that was focused uh, mainly on uh, single, single site sorts of simulations, and so we've begun to think about you know, how can we move beyond that and, and try to do uncertainty quantification and surrogate model construction at, at regional scales? And just to motivate that a little bit, um, you can see our, our V1 offline um, lab models on, on the upper right there. We do a reasonably good job um, matching estimates of the global net 
carbon flux. Um, but when you start to look at um, bias maps on the bottom left, for example, uh, gross primary productivity, there are still some regions where the model is, is not doing quite as well. And so that might be um, opportunities for us to try to reduce model biases through calibration. Um, and so when we do these uh, site level uh, exercises with sensitivity analysis and, and eventually calibration, um, we, we can generally do a pretty good job, but they're not necessarily um, globally relevant. And so we've begun to explore that um, regional sort of analysis using simple ELM where we can do simulations much more efficiently. Um, and for the example I'll show in the next slide, we've run a 47 uh, parameter ensemble um, 2,000 times, so randomly varying those parameters. Uh, and so here's an example of how we can construct surrogates with spatially and temporally varying outputs. For an example domain there on the upper left covering um, the northeastern portion of, of the United States and a little bit of Canada there. And so for this example, um, we've taken at the half degree grid, um, cut out that region and looked at 30 years of output. And so um, if we're thinking about trying to construct a surrogate model for that, we actually have 42,000, more than 42,000 um, GPP outputs. And so that's approximately uh, 1,600 grid cells times 30 years of output. And so Traditionally, traditional methods of building surrogates for those kind of one at a time for all of those is, is very cumbersome. And so if we take just eight of those parameters, randomly vary them and, and try to construct a surrogate, uh, one thing that becomes obvious across this ensemble is that outputs are highly correlated in both space and time. And so that, that makes sense. If you have two neighboring grid cells, they're experiencing similar um, climates and, and behaving similarly um, with with um, the same sets of parameters. And so Dan Liu here at Oak Ridge has developed an approach where she can apply a singular value decomposition to reduce the dimensionality of those outputs. And so taking those 42,000 outputs, um, it can be reduced down to about five uh, singular values, but still maintaining, uh, able to capture most of the uh, variance in the, uh, in the original data set. And so then she takes that and trains a uh, neural network um, to represent those five singular values as a surrogate model. And she compared that to an approach where she uh, would take 42, those 42,000 uh, outputs and train uh, networks on, on all of those. And so you might imagine it's much easier um, to train the, the five um, and much fewer time. And as it turns out, um, you also need fewer samples or a smaller ensemble in order to uh, obtain the same amount of accuracy that, that you would with, with the other approach. And so the, the graph there um, on the upper left in uh, case one is um, the approach where she's taken the singular value decomposition and 20 training samples. Uh, and in that case, it only took about four seconds to, to train that, those neural networks. Um, and she obtained a correlation of uh, R squared of about 0.95 against the original ELM outputs. Whereas um, training those um, neural networks sort of individually to get the same amount of accuracy, um, you see as the blue line going up and the, the red line going up, you need uh, about 200 ensemble members and it takes, um, about a thousand seconds, so many many times uh, slower uh, if we don't take that dimensionality reduction approach. And then on the bottom, that just shows sort of how well uh, that surrogate model is performing over the 1400 or so grid cells. And for most grid cells, it does a reasonably good job. And so it's uh, re reproducing the um, interannual variability in the original time series with an R squared of about 0.95 for most, with some exceptions there as we move up towards um, the higher numbers, which represent uh, more northern areas. And it turns out that um, in, in the ensemble, across that ensemble, um, you end up getting values or some values of, of zero uh, productivity or very marginal productivity. And if you have a, enough of those, it, it makes the uh, neural network and many other methods also much more difficult um, to train. Um, 
to train those neural networks, she's also developed a method where we can optimize the hyperparameters um, that are used to construct the, the neural network, and that, that's quite important in, in getting that level of accuracy. But it was quite encouraging to us that um, you can do this good of a job with, with only 20 training samples um, because that would open up, you know, we could, we could start looking at more complex model structures, um, not just simple ELM, but it may be possible to run, you know, 20 global simulations. Um, if we can get that same amount of, of surrogate accuracy. So now I'll hand it back to Kachik to talk about inverse modeling and, and calibration. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so uh, a slight switch of gears now when inverse modeling kicks in. If you look at the top part of the picture that uh, uh, you have already seen, this is how to propagate input uncertainties. Usually we start with the range because we don't know better. But when observational data on some QoIs arrives or experimental or observational data arrives, uh, you can actually inform these input parameters and get more meaningful probability distributions for input parameters for uh, for predictions that are more targeted and more closer to the observed data. And this is a basic task of inverse modeling or parameter tuning. Uh, and that incorporates, of course, data noise in, in it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the workflow uh, uh, that uh, so is, is, is the main uh, uh, theme of this part uh, is um, combination of forward and inverse, where in the first block you have forward uh, propagation or surrogate construction with relatively uninformative ranges of the input parameters. When you build a surrogate, you see how accurate it is, do global sensitivity analysis, possibly reduce the dimension and build a more accurate surrogate uh, and uh, possibly change the form of the surrogate, etc. But try to get as an accurate surrogate as possible with given amount of computational budget. And then using that surrogate, uh, one can fit that into a calibration machinery, which I'll detail next. Uh, and get a parameter posterior distribution, PDFs, that are much more targeted and much more correct when it comes to comparing to the data. And out of that, then you can predict the model. I, I, I call here any model, but it, what I mean is any quantity of interest out of the model and get prediction that is now informed with the data. That uh, closes the loop in a way uh, of, of this workflow. Next slide. Uh, so the main approach that we take uh, in calibrating uh, uh, model parameters given observational data is Bayesian approach, which is uh, very flexible and allows incorporating various sources of, of sources of uncertainty in a formal and robust way. Uh, typically, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling is performed for building posterior PDFs of these input parameters. Uh, but because these are usually high dimensional PDFs uh, and usually also they look uh, relatively ugly, uh, that they challenge MCMC methods. Uh, we do employ several uh, uh, advanced ad uh, adaptive MCMC methods to enable this. But more than anything, MCMC would have required online evaluation of the model that definitely we cannot afford. This is why surrogates are handy. So we replace the model with the surrogate that is cheap to evaluate and easy to plug into the MCMC uh, engine. Um, at the end of the day, what we get, we get predictive uncertainty out of your model that is augmented now with surrogate error and observational noise. This is observational noise, not a uh, plain noise, but it rather its impact to the predictive variance of the QOI that you are interested in, okay? Next slide. However, the elephant in the room here is in this prediction variance decomposition is the model error. So the conventional vanilla implementation of Bayesian calibration or model tuning assumes that your model is correct. Model is true uh, model behind the data, which is never the case. Uh, the model structural error or model error, as I call it, is the discrepancy from your model to the truth, and uh, that's uh, uh, that's something that needs to be handled, and that's uh, one key advance that I want to talk about the rest of the slides in, in my part of the talk. We do want to add model error component to predictive variance decomposition. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it is, uh, as I said, crucial and often the dominant component of predictive uncertainty, and if you ignore it, uh, uh, I'll there are technical details, but if you ignore it, uh, you get biased estimates of model input parameters. And as a con uh, consequence of it, you get biased predictions and also overconfident predictions, 
because of the fact that ignored model error uh, during the calibration process. Uh, again, the goal is to have a prediction variance that includes the model error component. And representing and estimating model error is going to be very useful for computational predictions for the re rest of the pipeline, like, like optimal experimental design or decision making. And uh, it helps answer questions that I often get from domain scientists, like is it worth resolving details or just parameterize empirically certain parts of the model or optimal resource allocation, like do I improve my model, go higher resolution or run more simulations with a given computational budget that uh, we have handy. So uh, estimating model error will help us actually uh, to get to some of those answers down the road. Uh, next slide. Uh, the conventional way of dealing with model error is model correction that comes from statistical literature where you add certain stochastic process like Gaussian process to your model uh, that is correlated. Uh, it works fine in many cases, but for physical models, it has a lot of drawbacks that we actually do not like. For example, you can correct your model to fit the data uh, on I don't know temperature, but if you want to predict another quantity of interest, leaf area index, uh, you cannot really use this unphysical stochastic term that you correct the temperature with uh, to predict uh, um, uh, another QOI, uh, like say leaf area index. Uh, so what we do, we try to embed stochastic term in the model uh, um, uh, to enable physics constraints as well as to enable prediction of uh, a set of quantities of interest out of the model. Um, this embedding, uh, uh, and I'll detail a little bit more with the workflow that is shown on the right top, uh, uh, helps uh, disambiguate between model error and data noise, uh, uh, and is a core FASMAT capability that I've been working on for the last several years with many different collaborators uh, uh, on and off. Uh, the key aspect of it is that it allows us to get predictive variants that can now be decomposed into a model error component as well. So the bottom right plot is, a, uh, is, is, is an example result that we have in one of the sites, GPP prediction, uh, where we calibrated um, monthly average data, well, calibrated the model with monthly average data, and we get prediction uncertainty uh, that can be decomposed into pieces due to surrogate error, model error, and uh, uh, posterior parameter uncertainty. Um, it helps uh, point to submodels and parameters that are usually the culprit uh, of uh, uh, where the model error is happening, basically. And more often than not, we see that it is the dominant component, of course. Next slide. Uh, another a bit more academic example, just to highlight what uh, this procedure actually does. Uh, uh, here, uh, calibration of uh, monthly data of latent heat flux, uh, uh, calibration of ELM using monthly data on latent heat flux. Uh, as I said, uh, academic exercise, I have uh, enabled uh, enough data and the noise structure to have parameter or posterior uncertainty in this case uh, be driven down to uh, essentially negligible. You can see that the peaks are, uh, summer peaks are not, uh, not captured well uh, in the prediction. Uh, go to the next slide then. When we incorporate model error in the prediction, summer peaks are all of a sudden uh, 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 um, captured. So the model actually correctly recognizes that summer peaks are captured. Uh, some of the low values are not captured well, and that, that is understood because the procedure uh, highlights what it can do, but also shows what it cannot do. Uh, because the methodology is non-intrusive working with surrogates, we are married with the same structure of the of the of the uh, of the model. Uh, it shows that with the given structure, we cannot actually capture the lower values as well, but we do uh, uh, capture the higher values. And it also, in a sort of semi-automated way, highlights the parameters that are the culprit that are necessary to tweak in order to capture the summer peaks better. Um, next slide. And what this also allows, this embedding model error, unlike the conventional external correction, what this also allows is a, a, a prediction of unobservable quantities like net primary productivity when there is no data with it. So we can predict now with model error augmented in the prediction. Uh, with external correction to the data on latent heat flux, we wouldn't be able to uh, uh, extrapolate quote unquote uh, 
those predictions to MPP. With embedded correction, we are able to do this extrapolation in a somewhat meaningful way. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, a different type of extrapolation is when you calibrate in one side and you of Michigan side that you saw in previous uh, plot and try to predict uh, uh, a quantity of interest in another side. Assumption is that model goes wrong in a similar way across two sides, right? Uh, and uh, again, embedding model structural error inside the model allows you to do this in a meaningful and consistent way. Um, next slide, please. Just to summarize uh, and highlight, this workflow uh, has been augmented with the extra step where we do stochastic embedding inside the model. However, this is not really looking under the hood of the code and writing different things in the code. This is embedding uh, done in the surrogate. So your model is still uh, dealt with as a black box. So I want to highlight this. This is embedded structural error approach but it's still non-intrusive and allows a meaningful exploration of your model predictive uncertainties. And at the end of the day, what you get is predictive variance that can be decomposed into several pieces, and then modeler can decide what to blame and what to target and what to improve in terms of predictive uncertainty. Uh, next slide, I think I am handing this back to Dan. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So um, I'll talk a little bit now about trying to, I guess, close the Modex loop through opti optimal experimental design. And so we can take what we've learned from these UQ uh, calibration exercises um, and inform new potential new observation locations. And so this is a very simple example, um, given the uncertainty. And so going back to that regional uh, simple ELM ensemble, uh, given the uncertainty of GPP from that ensemble, where could we put new observations to optimally reduce that posterior uncertainty? Um, and so the example here on the right, we can see um, in red a hypothetical region of interest focused over the southeast United States, so about a quarter of the, the original domain there, about 430 grid cells. Um, our quantity of interest is the aggregated uh, gross primary productivity in that region. And so we're asking this framework where if we had um, had funds available to observe this quantity at uh, several grid cells, where can we put those, uh, which grid cells would we put those observations in? And those are not necessarily restricted to that red area, even though we're trying to predict it. Um, it could go anywhere also in the dark blue area. And so to do that here, uh, specifically, um, we're looking at five new sites. So where could we put five uh, potential flux towers or other, other methods that might uh, observe GPP for observations to reduce that uncertainty? And, and for this, we and our, our colleagues at uh, MIT have used a, a greedy algorithm sort of to optimize the locations of uh, five potential um, towers. And then they looked at how well that um, algorithm performed um, by looking at sort of the whole distribution of potential uh, distributions of uh, locations of, of sites to place. And so as it turns out, so the, the identified locations there in red on the left and sort of the red, uh, small red bar there on the right shows that they, they have indeed picked the, um, the best uh, set of points to optimally reduce the uncertainty. And the five points there are sort of spread out over the, the southeastern U.S. through that domain um, in uh, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, and, and Virginia, North Carolina. Um, kind of, and in some ways, like kind of a ring bounding um, that region. So not necessarily surprising, um, but a, a quantitative way to say, you know, uh, given these model results, given um, some posterior uncertainty, where could we place um, new observations if, if our goal is to reduce uh, regional uncertainties? So uh, I want to talk then a little bit about potential um, next steps. And so we've, we've talked so far about this, this simple ELM and ELM sort of single site uh, evaluations of uncertainty quantification. So uh, in coordination with our um, SFA here at Oak Ridge, we're working to develop uh, functional units. And so looking more in, inside of ELM to take it apart and represent some of the process submodels rather than the whole model um, with, with surrogate models. And so that could allow us to um, 
take, for example, phenology algorithms or canopy process algorithms and develop surrogates for those. Um, and the advantage of that is a you know a smaller uh, smaller number of parameters is involved in the submodels, and so we can look specifically at processes, um, especially when we have data that are geared towards um, just quantities of interest focused on, on those processes. Um, GPP would be one example of that as related to the canopy part of the model. And then we could do calibration in a more hierarchical way um, using those submodels and their surrogate representations. And then the more integrated variables like NEE, Net Ecosystem Exchange, that involve um, all the model components together, um, and then we could, we could calibrate those uh, more at the end. And this could help us enable things like um, ecological forecasting or, or um, a more near real-time ability uh, to forecast uh, carbon fluxes, for example, uh, at specific sites. Um, so, also we're thinking about, you know, how do we, how would you do UQ in the coupled system? Of course, the model is very expensive, um, and it, we can do reasonably well um, in, a, in an individual component. For example, if you look at the bias and latent heat flux in our offline uh, ELM simulations, we get the, the plot there on the upper left. But if you look at the result in the coupled simulation, um, you get a much different pattern of, of bias. And so those biases are you know, potentially related to other components or those arise out of um, the coupling between components. So by just by looking at offline components, you won't get that sort of analysis. Um, there's a large computational demand for, for individual experiments, including spin up so that really limits um, what we can do there. Um, but hopefully um, some of the things that we're working on, especially with uh, machine learning, can help us lead to potentially more meaningful UQ in a coupled system. So the, the promising result where um, we can use dimension reduction methods to reduce the number of uh, ensemble members required um, might help us there. Uh, in the awesome SIDAC, we're looking at um, single column model land atmosphere coupling. So we're beginning to look at that, and we have an example there of a sensitivity analysis we've performed at the Go Amazon site, so from the library of cases available um, within the single column model. And so we can, uh, given that framework, we can look at um, the sensitivity of not just the land variables, but of, of uh, atmosphere variables in the single column framework, such as rain, um, the sensitivity of those variables to uh, land model parameters. And finally, um, just to summarize, so we, we talked a bit about forward uncertainty quantification uh, or uncertainty propagation. And for that, surrogate modeling is really a key for these expensive models um, like ELM. So for single uh, site or column simulations, we do have, I think, a pretty well-developed workflow. Um, and we've shown some examples of that. And we're definitely willing to work with, with core NGD or, or ecosystem projects that, that might be interested in performing these kinds of uh, UQ studies. And there are several options for producing those surrogate models um, from polynomial chaos, um, low rank tensors, and, and um, neural networks as well. Um, different varieties, varieties of those. Um, we're looking into more advanced um, space or time surrogate modeling tools available. We don't have those very well standardized yet, but we're hoping to produce more of that uh, in, in the future. And with a combination of approaches, we can achieve pretty high uh, surrogate accuracy in a lot of cases with a reasonable, uh, computationally reasonable number of, of simulations. And the sensitivity analysis exercises that we've done have, have really helped us, I think, learn um, what processes and parameters are, are dominating um, specific quantities of interest. And it's, it's not always straightforward as to, as to why until you get down into the, um, the mechanisms of the model to try to understand that a little better. And then working towards inverse UQ, uh, Bayesian model calibration. So we typically will use uh, mo the MCMC Markov chain Monte Carlo technique uh, in conjunction with uh, surrogate model. And for that, you know, it does have a higher demand for accuracy in the surrogate to get a good uh, calibration result, but those um, are, are feasible now. And Kachik mentioned that we're, we're able to, to try to incorporate uh, model structural error in those predictions, um, both in the posteriors of the, the parameters and the predictions there. And finally, we're um, trying to 
enable um, this formalization of the MODEX loop by uh, taking those, what we've learned from sensitivity analysis and calibration and using that to, to try to determine where and when um, we might place new observations to optimally locate uh, new observations that reduce uh, model uncertainty. And that's all we have. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to end the recording now and then we can have a discussion offline.